a social media expert already. Look at that. So, ladies and gentlemen, thanks very much. My name's Ken McIntosh. I'm the presenting officer here in Holyrood. And uh, can I just say thank you very much for coming along this evening and to our Festival of Politics. This is our, our 14th year, uh, and it's a chance uh, not just for you to listen or spectate here in the Parliament, but to engage. So the whole point this evening is for you to join the discussion, to share your views, to ask Darren some questions, but also to put some points across uh, and generally not, not heckle. Darren's already been heckled this evening, so no heck. But just to, to put some points across. So, and if uh, you're so minded, uh, we're live on Facebook, Facebook Live at the moment, and we're using the hashtag FOP2018. So uh, Festival of Politics 2018, hashtag if some, some people are looking blank and others are nodding sagely. So um, I, I want to introduce, if I can, our guest this evening, Darren McGarvey, also known as Loki. Uh, so Darren is a writer, commentator, performer and community activist. Until Poverty Safari catapulted him to recognition as a writer, Darren was best known as the rapper Loki, having recorded numerous albums as a hip hop artist. Darren grew up in Pollock in Glasgow, his mother was an alcoholic who died when he was 17 years old. Cared for by his father, who encouraged Darren and his siblings' creativity and urged them to express themselves through music, he merged this love of music with his fascination with words. Darren developed an expansive vocabulary at a young age, and he credits that as helping him understand and translate life's experiences. These experiences included dealing with his mother's death, his own drinking, drug and food problems, mental health issues, homelessness, and living on disability allowance, all of which he has used as inspiration in his writing. Darren has previously worked as everything from a bingo caller to voluntary community worker, as a member of the Poverty Truth Commission, rapper in residence at the Violence Reduction Unit, and as a co-writer with the National Theatre of Scotland. And he's just been announced, just today I think, as one of the new presenters, or yesterday, for BBC Scotland's new channel to be launched in February next year. He studied journalism at Glasgow Clyde, Clyde College and regularly writes for The Daily Record, The Guardian and Holyrood magazine. And his book, Poverty Safari, Understanding the Anger of Britain's Underclass, won the prestigious Orwell Prize in 2018 and has been praised by everyone from Ken Loach to Irvin Welsh, First Minister Nicola Sturgeon and J.K. Rowling, who is quoted as saying, it is hard to think of a more timely, powerful or necessary book. He recently played to sold out audiences when he took his Poverty Safari live show to the Edinburgh Fringe, featuring elements of rap, comedy and spoken word to explore some of his book's central themes of social inequality, political division and class through an artistic lens. Darren lives in East Kilbride with his partner and two young children. So please join me in welcoming Darren McGarvey. Apologies for the long intro. I hope you recognise yourself in that introduction as it's well. It's very well researched. That's I know you didn't. I know you didn't. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I've got an army of people. <laughs> yes, I know that. No, I, I, and I want to start with one of the things you said there about just about your own, your own eloquence. You know, how, how did you become so articulate? Because your education was interrupted, and yet it has catapulted you to, to uh, national prominence as a writer and as a speaker and as a performer. Well. There are two answers to the question. One is the polite answer. <laughs> this is an so this Edinburgh is, audience. So this yeah. is a question that I get a lot, and over the years I've decided to be a bit more magnanimous in how I respond to it. So the reason that I'm able to speak the way that I speak is because I come from a family where we're all very expressive and encouraged to express ourselves, whether it be through music, or writing or activism. I guess for me, then I understood the power of words early on because of the reactions that you would get from people around you based on the things that you would say. And I just always found it fascinating. And then also the fact that in the community that I grew up in, there was certain restrictions on how you could speak. And that fascinated me because I thought, well, why is, this a, why is this a red line? You know, why is using the word beautiful to describe a girl's hair in school, inviting a bus full of laughter. What sort of message is that telling me about what sort of person I'm supposed to be and how am I going to navigate that? Um, so that's the, that's the polite answer. 
Um, That's the polite the other answer. <laughs> the other answer is, why wouldn't I be articulate? <laughs> I think it's not, it's not why you wouldn't be articulate, but, I mean, you, you're exceptionally so. Yeah. I mean, it's not... It, it, I, compared I, to who, though? That's compared to everybody. Aye. Compared to everybody. No, that's, that's cool. Here, I'm down with that. Because, <laughs> yeah. see, maybe it's me being the defensive, but I always take it as I'm more... I, I, I'm able to put words together unlike the usual scruff that you hear from them. You know, that's the way I, yeah, inter well, that's the way I kind of interpret it. But I think some, there's something in it. There's something in it and, and, and that how communities that I come from and a lot of people in here probably come from, uh, that, uh, how we're framed when we do well. So we're always framed as a sort of diamond in the rough or a kind of success story because that's a kind of popular media trope. Mm. So it creates a perception uh, to people outside that community that, that, that someone like me is, is an exception to the rule when actually if there were more opportunities and there wasn't so much dysfunction to navigate, then there would definitely be a lot more People, although I see a lot of Scottish working class writers doing very well, to be honest, as well, <laughs> and a lot of the bestsellers lists for non-fiction and all of that as well. So um, I, I do think I've learned that it's good to have the polite answer and the more frank answer because really you're trying to you're trying to educate people where they might have a blind spot and not and not disconnect because something they say might offend you. No, there's there's, there's no doubt that. Um the, the contrast, there's no, there's no doubt at all that the contrast between your own fluency with words and your own background is, uh, is a, a thing that, that is, is remarked upon. But it's more than that. It's the fact that uh, you, you actually talk in your book about this, about the fact that you, you have to choose to limit your vocabulary in so many situations. You, you deliberately have to. So you, you talked about someone, a girl when you're young saying she's got beautiful hair, but you, you actually said she's got effing beautiful hair because you couldn't say it. Yeah. It was like I had to, I had to kind of, I had to add the prefix, yeah. the vulgar prefix, so that the, 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 the more articulate and, mm. and expressive word, beautiful is more of an expressive word, isn't it? Mm. Um, so it's, it's kind of nested in that vulgarity. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then that, that means I might get a pass. Um, and, and, and the other thing, I think the other reason why I became tuned into words was because I wasn't a great reader. And, and I found that I could learn what I otherwise might learn from a book by listening to other people talk about things. So I was always tuned in. And it, it's worked out quite well for me because one of the reasons why I'm able to sometimes, annoyingly perhaps for some, uh, to engage with multiple perspectives simultaneously and understand the different moral worlds that people are coming from is because I'm a sucker for anybody who talks well. So before I've decided whether I agree with someone or not, I'm really committed to whatever it is that they're trying to say and I'm really trying to hear them. Not because I want to agree with them or because I necessarily think they're personally interested or even that their ideas are valid, but because the, the, the words are like music. So if they're put together in a certain way, uh, then, then it just perks my ear up. And I find that it becomes much easier for me to internalise, you know, what, what's written in between the words, what, what the subtext is, where they're coming from. And then even if, even if I come to a point where I decide I understand that point, like earlier on, I was in a discussion with a guy who's like a libertarian, you know, and... Um, like, I, I, I don't want to assume what everybody in here does and doesn't know. Of all the political uh, perspectives, uh, the libertarian viewpoint is the most interesting to me because uh, people who see themselves as libertarian almost pride themselves in the fact that they don't let their compassion overrule their mind. It's all about rational objectivity and individualism. And these are quite good principles in the right sort of moderation. Um, but it's funny as well because there's lots of overlap, you know, uh, with me in, in the tr traditional libertarian view where, you know, libertarians will tend to believe in the good judgment of working class people to make decisions about what they eat, what they drink, don't mess nanny state. And, 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 and as much as I disagree with that sometimes, I kind of, I like anyone who's like, come on, the working class people, <laughs> just by default. Yeah. So it means I can listen to a libertarian, understand where they're coming from, reflect their viewpoint back at them, uh, and at the same time thinking, you know, you, you do know you're talking a lot of garbage, though, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> if I have you've to, aye. Uh, you've, you've already touched on about five things I want to go off on here, including 
individual, hopefully we'll come back to them, individual responsibility. Um, uh, but in this case, you mentioned the fact that you hadn't read. See, I, I think I assumed, um, before I read your book, that you'd read your way to, you'd educated yourself, you know, and, and, and particularly in language, through reading, but you didn't. You, you, you stayed right away at the start, you struggled with reading, which, which is intriguing. So, because the words themselves, your use of language has been a route to social mobility. Now, you might, but I think social mobility is quite key to the, the things that you talk about. Yeah. But it has been your passport to success, has it not? Um, yeah, certainly professionally, I. Um, the, the, when I say I haven't read books, I just mean in the traditional format, handheld, and in the traditional way that a person would read a book from front to back. Now, that might like, sound funny. I've consumed millions of words. I remember listening to the audiobook of 1984 and listening to it in the wrong order, which makes for a very interesting experience. <laughs> and, 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 and because, because it's the kind of thing that I would put on at night almost to self-soothe, you know, like if I was uh, recovering from, from a, few, a few nights, a few weeks on it, right? Um, I would have these things on in the background. And that was a time where I started getting access to the internet, so I was able to find YouTube and find content that I wouldn't otherwise have. And I think YouTube has fundamentally changed the way a lot of us learn. You know, spe spe specifically a kind of gen spe specific generation. Um, it's, it's not necessarily about the, doing the deep dive and understanding one topic from one perspective all the way down. Mm -hmm. It's about, now it's about what do I need to know? Let me go and find a bit of that, understand that, and then jump over here, and then jump over there. And in and, and, and the process of doing that, you come across a lot of different people who talk really well, and they mag you're magnetised to them. And just by virtue of being interested in the way they speak, you learn automatically. And like I say, you don't necessarily need to agree. So, I mean, I'd be, I'm, 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 I'm quite surprised at the, the different range of political viewpoints uh, that I've been able to be, to come to terms with uh, that I maybe would have prejudged yeah. in, in, in a way that actually wasn't rooted in anything but just prejudice yeah. itself. Yeah, that comes out in your writing and your columns and your, and your book. Uh, so we might come back to that because I think this idea of how, how, how you have a passport to life um, and, and yours being words, and, but, but what is it for other people? You know, how, how come people are so trapped in, in their... Um, circumstances. Um, and we'll come on to poverty in a second, but before we do, you're very self-confessional, you're, you're very autobiographical in, in all your writing. Mm. Is, that, is that, does that come naturally? Is it easy? Do you, do you, do you think, is it, is it, I mean, are you like that when you chat to people all the time? I mean, you really wear your heart on your sleeve a lot. Yeah, um, I guess it's, it's, I guess it is a kind of just a, a personality trait in some ways, but I think it was something that I also kind of was conditioned to do in different ways. Um, my, it's been the case up until very recently that I would only be afforded access to conversations and platforms to speak if I divulged a certain level of, 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 of personal lived experience. Um, but also I've found actually, in the work that I've done throughout my life, and communities, even when I, as a teenager, was working with the people that were trying to stop the gang fighting in my own community. It's funny because if you don't gang fight, people call you a shite bag, right? <laughs> but actually, the things that I do require a lot more courage than joining a gang, you know? Like, I was going into the community and asking the gangs that I went to school with, <laughs> why stop this crap, do you know what I mean? Like, what are you doing this for? Why are you fighting all this? Look at it, it's derelict. And, uh, and, and those things were harder to do. And so I, I, I found whenever I was trying to engage with people, when you're, when you're, you know, you're trying to influence people's behaviour, you're trying to get people to self-reflect, you know, maybe it's people with drug problems, maybe it's people who are misbehaving in school. Um, the process of them transcending their difficulties is contingent on them looking inside themselves and thinking, is there anything within my competence that I can do, either becoming aware of behaviour or attitudes that's holding me back, or identifying some sort of support that I might need? And in order for them to do that, they have to be very open about what they're going through. And I find the quickest, most effective, and most ethical way to produce that 
is for me to do the exact same thing. And, and, and this is something that I find interesting. People will often commend me on my honesty. Mm. But what I'm inferring from that is that they're dishonest. When people say to me, well, you're very yeah. honest, yeah. then I'm like, well, you seem to have a problem with being honest then. Yeah. And it's interesting, isn't it? Because in this world, everyone seems very sure about what's right and wrong, and everyone's on the soapbox constantly on social media about this and that and next thing. And politicians are devising their next move based on the whole temperature of social media. But on social media, we all give one another a pass to be completely unauthentic every time we speak into the void. And it's quite frightening that people would take massive political decisions and calculations based on how people behave on social media because it's a completely fake persona that we're all constructing. So the fact that honesty is so affecting means we've got a long way to go. Um, and sometimes also, it's on a personal level, it's quite cathartic for me to talk about things and see how it impacts people. And that might not, you might not see that at, at the kind of public level or, 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 or on the public eye level, but the messages that I get from people, the people that come up to me and, and spend a wee bit longer talking to me when they're getting their book signed, and they, they sometimes are quite emotional and they've got things that they need to tell me because they've been affected. And honesty is something people will only venture to do and take the risk doing if they see it's being modelled to them. And I think honesty is a big part of well-being. It's a big part of social cohesion. And it's a big part of us learning to live together. And, 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 and I can't demand that other people if I'm not willing to do it first. Well, in, indeed, it's not just honesty, it's vulnerability too. Mm. And, and yet in your book, you talk, about, you talk about the stress of being vulnerable all the time and, mm. and the stress of making sure you're not vulnerable. Mm. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of taken aback by how open you are and therefore exposed and you know yeah that's quite attack. an insightful that's quite an insightful remark actually because recently i've been recently i've been struggling in my personal life partly because as much as as, as much as i was working hard because i thought i had a chance of making it as a writer or making mm. it as something mm. like what's actually happened is no really what i was sort of foreseen you know mm. the scale of it how quickly it happened mm. so i wasn't really prepared for it I mean, just right now, I'm sitting here, and I know I'm here, and I know on some level I've earned it, whatever it is, but on another level, I'm completely <laughs> detached from what's going on here, because I'm always sitting at home shouting at this room. <laughs> <laughs> and, telling, and telling the people that work here to stop applauding themselves. Ah. <laughs> And, uh, and, 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 and so, 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 so that comes with a certain level of kind of stress and exhaustion. I've got young kids, there's all these different relationships in my life that need to be maintained. There's a certain level of pressure now as a breadwinner to provide a certain quality of life for my children. And, uh, and, then, and then I look out onto social media and I, the, the most important issue of the day changes every day. But there's a part of my subconscious that's like, I want to know what the most important issue is and I'm going to really engage with it and then it just changes. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the issues that come up are things that directly impact me or challenge me, particularly things like the Me Too moment that we're in. And I remember the moment that, uh, the moment that it dawned on me that what I, I, I felt we were being asked to do as men was not necessarily paraphrase the things that feminists say on Twitter and sort of put it out there that we're terribly woke, but to actually look in the mirror and think, okay, so if masculinity can be toxic, and it's everywhere to the extent that even women are blind to it sometimes, then surely that must mean that I must already have been guilty of some of this stuff before in my life. Whether it was a lewd remark, whether it was some sort of sexist comment, or whether it was something else that maybe is a wee bit more serious. And so that was immediately what I instinctively knew I should do. But the problem is I was looking to social media for tips on how to go about that. <laughs> and as we all know, even within communities that largely align and agree, there are all sorts of different takes on what men should do, how men should respond, and actually it created, not to say, this is really difficult for men too. Yeah. That is absolutely not what I'm saying. <laughs> Someone out there will interpret it as that though, and that's part of the vulnerability. But actually, it forced me to kind of reflect almost morbidly and look for things that weren't there. Because I, I go really deep with this stuff, and I'm very kind of like rigorous with it. 
And I, and I found that even when I would write about the experience, there's always something you're going to write, no matter what your intention is, that's going to upset someone. And, 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 and I thought, you know what, but I'm just going to swallow that and suck it up, because that's the moment we're in. And, and men with a platform need to show a bit of, you no know, leadership. I'm not saying I'm special. I'm just saying, like, it's, it, 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 it's, it's, it's about being honest with ourselves mm. and, and, and also being kind to ourselves, you know, where we need to be. And so that, that's a funny thing I didn't expect mm. that was more mentally challenging and taxing and emotionally kind of frightening than I thought it would have been. But I'm happy that I've done that and, 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 and just sort of went through that journey. And I don't know any, I'm assuming there's other people out there who have felt the same thing by a cultural mm. moment that's so all encompassing and affects you specifically. I mean, think about all the parents out there that used to smack their kids thinking it was okay. Now it's illegal. Mm. So I mean, some of them are in this room and alive right now, and they're living on a fault line where I hope, one... I hope if they're in this room, they're alive. Can I just say that? Aye. <laughs> <laughs> good question. Good, good point. And, 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 and sorry to go, go on a bit, but it's just, it's that idea of it living in a time where an ethical norm changes so dramatically mm. that behaviour that you thought was innocent and innocuous and even jovial is actually dangerous, frightening, or even criminal. Mm. And it just changes like that. Mm. And we're all going to be on a fault line one day. It doesn't matter how woke you are. One day, you're going to find out something that you're doing right now, something that you're thinking right now, is uh, suddenly out of bounds. Mm. And you're going to see people writing about it in social media, and you're going to feel very threatened and challenged and frightened. And then that's when safe spaces don't seem like such a daft idea. Because <laughs> you're going to need to go and talk to somebody about it, you know? <laughs> if, you, if you're like me and you were brought up in the 70s, you, you thank your stars that you're not in prison these days, I can tell you that. So it's... Mm. Uh, oh, no laughter there. <laughs> that was a joke, by the way, that, okay? Just, just in case. But that's the sort of... That's the sort of... There's too many people in the 70s here. That's aye, aye. That's the kind of filter that people have now because of social media. Mm. So they screen something before they react to it. Because yeah. they're like, I don't know if this is a socially sanctioned reaction yeah, that I'm should have. But then we're all having a you debate. You feel better, but not laughing at my jokes. So aye, aye. Yeah. But we're all having a debate with a certain level of inauthenticity because we're all frightened of being shamed or saying the wrong thing. And it doesn't matter where on the spectrum we are. We all feel that within some community. And I think we need to move beyond <laughs> that in some way, recognising that restorative justice and, and, and compassion and, and, and are as important and that Fear and shame mm. are corrosive and toxic if they're untreated and actually lead to people making some really weird political decisions if they're sitting with that stuff. They're like, oh, hello, Mr. Peterson, yes. you know, on we're, Google. We're a long way from that. You don't know who Mr. Peterson is, do no, you? No, no, they're all, I'm, I'm not, no, Shivano either. But, <laughs> uh, can you say, though, not many of us have the self-honesty or, or even, you obviously have to answer all these questions yourself uh, and get to the truth, whereas I think most of us don't. I think most of us just accept that we've got these... Um, values. We think they're values, but they're just prejudices, maybe. Can I, can I move, because you've brought up so many other issues there about masculinity um, and others, but can I just start off in poverty, though? Because I think, um, perhaps not my generation, but so my parents' generation, for example, um, would think of poverty in particular as, uh, as hunger, as ma material poverty. Um, I mean, they're, they're more sophisticated than that, but, but the point is they, they recognise poverty in, in real terms, in terms of a roof over your head, food on the table and so on. But when you talk about, when you talk about poverty in your book and in your writing generally, the thing you identify is not the material possessions at all, it's, it's, uh, it's the stress, and that's the key for you for poverty. Do you want to just expand on that? Because it's, I have to say it's a, 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 it's a great analysis of, of why poverty is so... Uh, why it keeps you down. Yeah, and, it, and it, I think, and what, what's quite striking is that to people who live in it, it's the most obvious thing, but it just shows you the disconnect between the people who often are in charge of the solutions and discussing them, and the people who actually are in it. Because the minute I say to someone who grew up in a deprived community, you know, stress is the catalyst for a lot of these decisions that will happen in a lot of the direction of your life, it's not to say the social conditions aren't the chief activator of all of it, they are. But to understand some of the self-defeating behavior, the educational trajectories that people will take, um, how families break down, 
the, the likelihood that someone from a certain level of, of adversity will, will, will die younger, will go into the criminal justice system, will experience more serious mental health difficulties. Um, when you look at that through a lens of stress, it begins to join all the dots. Uh, it's the connective tissue between all of these different things. If you, if you talk to anybody that's sitting on the streets of Scotland right now begging for money, right, regardless of whether, regardless of whether they actually have somewhere to stay, whether they're begging and just kind of top up their money, whatever the background, right, the systems that are in place for them to become integrated back into sort of mainstream society where they might have access to benefits, education, employment, and potentially prosperity, that whole process is something many of them don't go on because just thinking about it's terrifying. Just thinking about it's stressful. And, and, and that's something that, that, that a lot of people find really hard to understand because they, mm. they see it from, if I was in that position, I would be doing everything I could to get myself an address, to get, a, or, or get whatever benefit entitlement. If I had to sit in the brew for eight hours one day, I would do that. And that's cool, like that, 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 that's, of course, but other people, the stress response kicks in and it undermines whatever good intentions they have that day. And the problem that we have just now is that we have a society, um, we have, particularly at, at UK level just now, I have to say, and, and, and I, don't, I don't engage in all this Tory scum part, or I don't think that's mm -hmm. cool, right? Scum is a very specific word for a very specific type of person, right? Where I come from. Mm -hmm. So I don't throw that about. Mm -hmm. However, in Westminster just now, I think the levels of privilege of the people in power is, 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 finding, is, is, is expressed in all of the terrible decisions that are being made regarding social policies, whether it's universal credit, whether it's the hostile environment policy at the Home Office. And the hostile environment policy at the Home Office is the doctrine underscoring all of it across all of public services. So it's a deep belief, if you're being charitable about this government, it's a belief that if you create conditions of hostility at the institutional level, then people will just automatically self-correct because they would rather go through a process of voluntary self-correction than deal with a public institution that they're legally entitled to seek support from, whether that be welfare, whether that be immigration, home office. And while I understand that tough love is necessary at certain points in our lives, the idea that emotionally scarred people from adversity or even just people living in the stress of unwork poverty are gonna do anything but hide from a letter from the DWP, are gonna do anything but be frightened when they pick up the phone. I mean, their life is scary enough. Why is the government trying to frighten them? If you read a letter that comes through the door for any government department, I just phoned up HMRC the other day, volunteering to pay back money that I owe them because I can afford that. And the way they spoke to me, I didn't get involved in a crap, right? But I knew that, I was like, man, that's a bit like that letter I got for the Department of Work and Pensions years ago when I get sanctioned because somebody in my family attempted suicide and I couldn't make an appointment. Wet appointment. Yeah. It's the way the letter's written. It's reminding you at every stage, if you put a foot wrong, you're done. Mm. And anything they do to help you, you're not entitled to that help. We're deciding to give you that help. So not only are these social conditions harsh, but we are, remember, we are making sure you do not forget that you should be very frightened at us. It's just an emotionally illiterate way to conduct social policy. I'm sorry if there's any Tories in here, but it is. <laughs> Even Conservatives know it's too much. Even Conservatives know it's too much. They intuitively know it's too much, but they just kind of get behind Corbyn, and I understand that. <laughs> <laughs> That's asking an awful lot of us. <laughs> so, uh, just on that though, just about the whole, the difference between the stress that is poverty and material consumption. You were on Twitter earlier today because you were challenged about, you know, poor people having big TVs and nice TVs and so on. I thought, just explain how you came back at that, because you, you talk about this in some of your work. Yeah, so, so I, my strategy is usually to accept that, that there's a grain of truth to the th thing that the person is saying. 
So in this case, it was somebody saying, well, how can they be poor if they've got tellies and all that, and, and material wealth on the surface? And I simply said, well, maybe it's to do with the culture of shame around poverty. You know, I, I still carry that shame. I've felt ashamed ever since I was a kid, and I don't know why. And, uh, and I'm still very self-conscious, even earlier when I got heckled and the guy was saying I was talking for too long. Mm. And I started thinking everybody on the panel thought that as well. And I pure just went into myself mm. and just retreated. And, uh, and I felt a sense of shame. So people who buy tellies at a bright house and bankrupt themselves and get into debt, maybe they're doing that because they think if they do those things, they can conceal the poverty and thus have some sort of brief reprieve from the sense of shame. Not necessarily just the shame at the level of culture, but also in their own communities mm -hmm. where we very much are very harsh with one another and police one another in terms of what we wear and what we do and where we're going on holiday. And it's just, it's the whole kind of dream of individualism and kind of like, not just capitalism, but a really intense, all-encompassing capitalism where we see ourselves as an audience would see us mm. all the time. Like we are the protagonists in our own wee screenplay. Mm. And when you're living on the breadline, that's a bit of a waste of your time. Yeah. <laughs> it's very stressful though, because it's all encompassing. And even if you intellectually know that you shouldn't be doing these things, the penalty is so high socially to not have the things everyone else has. Mm. So if, if people have an issue with that, then their issue should be with the billions and billions it's invested in, not just advertising, but understanding the human mind and all the things that we're vulnerable to and how to get an idea in there and stuck in there. Imagine social services were as intuitive as uh, McDonald's and Coca-Cola. <laughs> Good thinking, and, but but that that whole idea of buying ninety pound trainers, which does you, you know the effect it has mm -hmm. outside, you know, uh, on on maybe it's a class divide, or maybe it's more than that. But you know, the idea of choice, of having some sort of choice, and spending money that you don't have on something that you can't afford, mm -hmm. and something that other people disapprove of, that's a result of stress, you see. Yeah, well, it's a re result of social pressures, that particular spending. Then you have the impulsivity. And, and then you have a lack of concept of the value of money because you never have it. So money's this thing that just comes and goes. I mean, I'm getting better at managing what money I have now and more responsible in the sense that I'll look to pay off debts if I come into some money. Um, but I still find it difficult to part with and, and, and I'm, not, I'm not kind of tight or anything like that. In fact, sometimes I'm too generous. Maybe some sort of guilt is at work there. But I, I find there's an impulsivity that creeps into my life. Before I recognise it, I'm on the train with two Burger Kings and eating four toffee crisps, mm -hmm. and I've bought something on the phone, and I've said something stupid online. Before I know it, I'm like, man, I've got a real impulse control problem. And if you look at a lot of the data around how stress and poverty affects people at the level of cognition, then you'll find that actually impulse control is one of the things that's, that's flagged up as, as being uh, a, a kind of a variable open to, to many differences, depending on the severity of the stress experienced. Um, to the point where I've, I've seen psychiatrists who've, who've, who've hypothesized that I might have a, some kind of personality disorder I just, I just treat it with my recovery programme. I just think it's, uh, it's me, but I, I, I'm not recommending everybody do that. You might need other help, you know, but it's just I, I could do with one less label at this point. <laughs> but the, 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 uh, the, 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 the impulsivity, and it's not making excuses, right? If I'm impulsive, there's a certain kind of level of, right, I need to get a grip on this. I need to understand when I'm stressed and I'm tired, I'm likelier to forget that I don't want to eat chocolate and spend the night zoning out to the internet, watching things that are bad for me. Um, so I need to build in some kind of like safety mechanisms so that when I do eventually get tired, which is inevitable, there are some other options there for me. That's personal responsibility it looks like in my life. Mm. Um, but, but even then it doesn't mitigate the all encompassing sensory obstacle course that people have to traverse, regardless of what social class they come from. It's just you can buy into 
a wee bit of a fancier sensory obstacle course, do you know what I mean, if you've got a bit of cash? So I'll definitely come back to individual responsibility because it's, it's one of the most interesting observations or directions you've taken yourself in and encouraging others to. But before we come to that, you talk about, um, you're talking about the uh, DSS and other agencies there. In your book, you're very um, uh, direct about what you call the poverty industry. Um, so you, it's quite funny because you do the, the thing of recognising and also feeling guilty because you, you recognise yourself, it's, support, it's supported you and it's, it's, it still supports other people, but it's a self-continuing um, industry. It, it actually looks after its own and you're quite critical of it. It doesn't actually look, raise people out of poverty, it actually traps them in it. Yeah, um, it's, it, it's not necessarily because the org organisations of the people working in them, it's the, system, it's the system in which all of these things are couched. So the current system that we have sees poverty not as something to eradicate, but something that has to be managed. So at some level, we're accepting that this kind of form of social democracy, one of the externalities is some people will always live in poverty. So we have to create an infrastructure and an industry or kind of social architecture or whatever to deal with that and manage it and help people. No, that's fine. Some people might accept that as, you know, a, 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 a decent, moral position for a society, considering we've enjoyed a lot of relative prosperity, even people who live in poverty here are, 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 have access mostly to some basic things like education that a lot of people in the past haven't had. Um, but at the same time, the, the problem with certain aspects of, and I don't like the term poverty industry, but it's the term that a lot of people use in the community that I come from, if they're using the polite, term yeah. and in a way I've got to use those terms because I'm trying to reflect a bit of them back at them and really what I was saying actually is not controversial at grassroots level of these organisations it's not these are the things people know intuitively whether they're youth workers whether they work for local authorities whether they work for third sector uh, whatever they work for you know the people that are out there the nurses on the ward as my sponsor says they get it straight away. They're like, they're always trying to communicate that stuff up the, up the chain. Um, it's a wee bit further up where people get a bit salty about it. And that's usually the case. Um, because I think when you, become, when you become detached from what it is that you got into the thing to do or to sort or to be involved in, you don't perceive yourself as detached. You see yourself as just becoming more effective at that job. So, so the response that you're getting from the people you think you're helping is, is, is the opposite of what you want and what your intentions are. And that's where the conflict comes in. And actually, as critical as I am, I, I do line out in a lot of detail how you might go about trying to avoid setting up those conflicts and also recognising that there is a lot of goodwill out there and that you can't avoid people having to intervene in communities in some way. Um, but it's about being mindful of how it might be perceived when we do it. And mm -hmm. all our wee default tricks we fall back on when we get challenged about stuff mm -hmm. uh, that are really about us demonstrating authority. Mm -hmm. uh, and and I, don't, I don't want working class communities to be so skeptical of charities that they would be happy to see them on the front page of the Sun newspaper mm -hmm. every day getting ripped to shreds. I don't want that opinion to exist in working class communities. I'll go into working class communities and challenge it. Um, but the only way I can challenge it is to say, aye, aye, I spoke to people at Bernardo's. They get it. They're working on it. Do you know what I mean? But think of all this other stuff that they're doing, mm -hmm. working with these kids that have been abused, working with this, that, and the next thing. Um, and so aye, it's, it's just it's yeah. about being frank, but also saying, look, I know you're trying to do the right thing here. Yeah. I appreciate actually how, sorry, I know my answers are long, but they're no simple questions. And the, the, I, I recognise that it's inherently difficult to cross any kind of class line or any line of identity whatsoever. I get that. And sometimes I'm on the receiving end of being challenged when I think I know what I'm talking about and, and, and I don't like it at mm. first. But I suck it up. Mm. I suck it up. Because sometimes we're the ones on the soapbox telling everybody how it is and other times we need to sit down and shut up, you know? Mm. I have to say, I think you're quite good at challenging yourself and others. Um, I've got some more questions, but just catch me. I'm just concentrating on paying attention to Dan. Put your hand up if you want to come in, ask a question or anything like that. Look at that, they're all 
Uh, oh, look at that. Okay. Okay, well, having said that, I better take it in. So the microphone should come on right in front of you when you. Um, good evening. Um, thanks very much. Um, I am interested in hearing what you think of some uh, thing. I'm, I'm maybe part of that poverty industry. Um, I uh, work in policy and public affairs in Scotland, and one of the things that um, we've been promoting my organisation is I'm not, I'm not trying to lobby anyone here, I just genuinely want to hear what you think of it. Is um, I'll, I'll try and keep it short. Is I represent speech and language therapists uh, in Scotland, and we've been looking at or trying to raise up this idea of the intergenerational cycle of communication disadvantage and all that kind of that process, the system, and being terrified of the interaction with the system. And one of the great things that's happened in Scotland as a result of that is that in our social security welfare system now, it is a duty to make sure that the agency, the directorate, the whole system is communication inclusive in that it's the, it's the ownership of the agency to make sure that it communicates in a way that works for the people that should be getting the welfare. And I just wonder what you, from your perspective, what you think of that idea? I think it's a natural evolution based on clearly trying every other possible way and finding that it doesn't work. And that's, I don't say that facetiously, I just mean it's a natural, that's how we find out what works. I mean, obviously, if, if, if that, I just mean, if you knew that worked 10 years ago, you would have done it then. So there's something about the way that we figure things out as a society, institutions, communities, individuals, where we try things again and again, it might solve some problems, and then we hit a wall. And the wall, a lot of the time, in communities and individuals' lives is that the system's only set up to take a certain kind of income and call. I, I, I think I actually my, my younger brother, um, I've got two young brothers, one of them's in prison just now. Classic tale of someone who becomes socially excluded, grew up, didn't have any connection really to his parents, uh, bereavement, he said residential instability, I've only really known him for the last three years uh, and still find it difficult to connect. And, uh, and, 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 and he tells me these stories about going to talk to people about getting a flat and going to talk to people that are meant to help in social work and all that. And, 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 and his thing, he doesn't realise this is what he's communicating to me, but I get it. His thing is, he gets dead flustered because he can't communicate. And the person that he's dealing with is making value judgments on how he's expressing that. Now, I, you can't allow somebody to be aggressive or threatening. And I think you have to be very clear when someone is being uh, racist, for example. Say somebody's in moaning about not getting a house and they're blaming the Roma community or something for it, right? Um, but at the same time, there has to be a certain degree of flexibility and recognition of where that person is and what do we ultimately want. Do we want them leaving the room and never coming back again? Or are we going to try and bend ourselves in some way without co-signing all the crap to say, let's park that for now and just deal with the issue here. And I think that's what you're trying to produce is that sort of result. And actually, the more that we walk alongside people, even when they are being a bit abrasive and offensive and even vulgar, um, we learn so much more. We become more intuitive to how to manage a situation like that. And we start to see some of the nuance in what at first might just seem like a total onslaught of challenging behavior. Uh, and, and it means that even if it doesn't work out with that particular person, we can take all that experience, bank it, and bring it into the next interaction, spread the word, you know, share experiences with other people. And I think that that's when, that's when you're talking about services getting really intuitive or trying to get more intuitive. They're recognizing it's about the rapport. You need to create a rapport with someone before they will move the way that society needs them to move to get them back in. Um, I hope that answered your question in some way. Or if it didn't, I'm really sorry. I tried my best. <laughs> yeah. Can I ask you? It, it you're saying it in a different way, but it, it feels like what we're talking about rings true to you. Okay. Yeah. We've got some more questions going up here as well, but I'll just come back in a second. Can I just ask you before we do about, about this idea of individual responsibility? Because it's, it's quite, that's quite a, a break. You know, if you, if you've, you say in your book and you talk about this in, in your writing about identifying with the politics of the left generally, 
uh, but you're quite critical of the left. And in particular, this idea that we are all individually responsible for our actions, or you have to accept some individual responsibility. Now, that um, that would make intuitive sense to a lot of people, but politically it's quite a, a dangerous philosophy to espouse because it is often seen as a right-wing position to have. Yeah, I think it's quite funny how people who would consider themselves radical mm. won't acknowledge some aspect of reality that's not offensive to most people. Mm. That's strange, isn't it? it absolutely. And that's, 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 that's a problem I find on the left, and, and I'm sure the left finds lots of problems in me. Um, <laughs> But actually, I'm just, I'm just expressing something. I'm just expressing what the world is in the community itself. I mean, it's not, people, working class people are not naturally just inclined to blame systemic issues for all their issues that they're dealing with. I mean, they intuitively understand they're always getting shafted on some level. They get that. There's a sort of kind of acceptance of it, not because they're being servile, but because they recognize, I need to get on with my life. I need to work, I've got a family, could have been worse, could have been born in the dark ages. Do you know what I mean? And sometimes that can be quite a healthy way to look at it, right? Whereas you got a lot of people on the left saying, this is the dark ages. Yeah. And you've got other people in communities like that, oh, hold on a minute, you know? When it comes to re re responsibility, I'm simply making the argument that, that people transcend difficulty when they become willing to engage with whatever support is out there, and that that is an act of marshalling your self-will. Mm. You can't, you could lay on the most intuitive service ever, right? And see someone doesn't buy into it, it's pointless. Mm. So it's like, how do you create that moment where the rapport's are there so that you can go and look them in the eye and say, so we've been working together for a while now, and you're doing good, but see the day, you're going to have to do the heavy lifting with this, and I'm going to be here the whole way with you. Mm. That's what personal responsibility looks like. It's, it, it's, it's someone acknowledging whatever scale that is in their life. It might be someone deciding not to run to the pub when a letter for the DWP comes through the door. That's an act of personal responsibility mm. because you've been down that road. You know where that ends. So you telling me that you need a service to deal with that moment, or can we just deal with it in this conversation? Because you know intuitively that the only way you're going to deal with your problem is no going to the pub, the day. So the day, that's what personal responsibility looks like. For somebody else, it might be going to a meeting with someone, a sponsor, phoning when they're thinking about using. These are all acts of self-will, personal responsibility, trial and error that incrementally improve the conditions of somebody's life. I'm not saying that mitigates neoliberal economics. I'm not saying that that's going to solve the Israel-Palestine problem, yeah. right, or climate change. I'm saying I've got to go into communities and write a book and punt a book that somebody can actually use right now. Mm -hmm. No waiting until Jeremy Corbyn, you know, kills the Rothschilds. Um, <laughs> I, 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 you know what I mean? Like, That's not in the manifesto yet, by the way. Yeah, that's yeah, enough. yeah. Do you know what I mean, though? No, I, I don't mean to be facetious, I and actually I would though. probably... Love to redact what I just said there. Yeah, I don't worry. <laughs> However, I was just trying to make a point that sometimes on the left, we have this hypothetical crash moment where suddenly a new society will come into view. Mm -hmm. And I understand that the society that we're in, in many ways, has shown serious signs of wear and tear. But I don't think it makes any sense to go into communities and say, there's literally nothing you can do the day. Mm -hmm. There's nothing you can do the day. Uh, nothing. Like, the world is just the way it is and you are screwed. The only thing you can do is vote for me. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Uh, <laughs> no, it's, it's, I mean, as an idea, it's been around and it used to be a left-wing idea as much as anybody else's, but it's sort of eroded and it became, politically, it's been seen as, you know, the, certainly the argument of, you know, lift yourself up by, the, by your bootstraps, you know, has been captured by the right, as it were. So it's co-opted by Thatcherism, absolutely. Mm. I get why it's a loaded term. All yeah. I'm saying is... I Nor don't, Norman Tebbett said, get on your bike. I mean, that's exactly... Aye. I yeah. didn't let violent bullies in school tell me what words I could and couldn't use. So I'm not going to let a bunch of left-wing academics tell me that I can't say the word personal responsibility when that's exactly what I mean. Yeah. Very good. <laughs> okay. uh, uh. There's hands going up everywhere, right? Uh, lady with the glasses there, and then there's two ladies right here. 
Yes. Hi. Um, I don't know if you saw question time last night, but it was really good to hear uh, someone from the audience talking about the serious uh, drug abuse issues here in Scotland. Um, and I just wanted to ask your views on it. Um, we've are you? Up the back. There you're there. Hi. Got you. Cool. So, um, personally, um, I've experienced a great deal of loss within my own family with drug abuse, and I feel very strongly um, that there's not enough being done to save young people. Um, I hear what you're saying about taking self-responsibility, but we have to look at the lack, total lack of rehabilitation centres yeah, yeah. in Scotland. There's one just outside Edinburgh Peebles that costs 12 grand to go to. Um, it's, you know, that 12 step sort of programme. And the millions of pounds that have been spent on methadone, which is slowly killing our younger generation. So um, I'm not trying to be funny. I know that you've been a user in the past. Uh, so have I. Mm -hmm. um, we're looking quite healthy, but you know, w what about the future of people that are younger, people that are coming up? Totally, and I think I, you, you make a really valid point about making sure that you get the balance between encouraging self-efficacy and agency wherever there's potential for somebody to say, you know what, the day I think I can manage this. Uh, and also that then being an excuse or, or what, what I currently hear, you know, let's encourage children to become more resilient so we don't have to have that difficult conversation with Amazon, you know? And I, and I, mm. and I think, I think w w when we're talking about personal responsibility, I tend to be of the mind that before you tell somebody to take responsibility for an issue, you have to really understand intimately what it is you're asking that specific individual to take responsibility for. And that's why I always talk about walking alongside people in communities. Um, now on the point about services, Drug addicts, like very most vulnerable, disenfranchised, polit politically disenfranchised groups, uh, they're the easiest ones to cut the money to. Homeless, drug addicts, certain groups, the, uh, certain ethnic gr groups, um, generally because they have no advocacy, really. Uh, they have no political representation. So while drug policy, drug rehabilitation, drug legalization, might be an issue that a politician in this room will speak on when it's in the news agenda. It's not a hobby horse, really, for a great deal of people. It's not the thing they're coming in here and battering on about every day until everybody's like, oh, here comes, you know, methadone, Mary. <laughs> uh, you know what I mean? Shut up about the meth scripts. And uh, uh, be be because, you know, and, uh, and that's, that's where the pressure comes in. That's where we come in. I took part in the recovery walk a couple of weeks ago, a few weeks ago in Glasgow. Uh, spoke quite frankly, actually broke one of the traditions of the fellowship that I'm in. Because I said, we need to engage in controversy. One of the traditions of the recovery fellowships is that we don't engage in controversy. We don't endorse or oppose political causes. You can't deal with addiction on this kind of industrial scale without getting political without saying something that's going to offend people in government, in addiction, and in recovery. And, uh, and, and, and I think actually in Dundee, the problem is so severe uh, that, that, that people are going to start getting angry enough that politicians will become very intuitive mm -hmm. to what they're, what they're saying suddenly. <laughs> you know, it's just a shame you need to kind of lose the rag for that to happen. Uh, particularly in communities where emotional stress is a catalyst for so many problems, you know. Um, but it's, it's, it's difficult, and I think you're, you're right to kind of call me on being careful about how I deploy the personal responsibility stuff. It's important that I always qualify exactly what I mean with that. Uh, and congratulations on your own recovery, and thank for your question. And Beth. <laughs> I'll take the two ladies here. Uh, uh, the one behind you first and then the one in the front row, please. Thanks very much. Um, I'm a secondary school teacher in a pretty deprived part of the country um, and serving a community very much like the one that you talk about in your book. And when I read your book, a lot of it spoke to me in terms of the things that our young people are going through. And I wonder what your view is about um, the kind of political drive just now, and indeed Nicola Sturgeon's kind of staking her reputation on it, um, to close the attainment gap in education. And so as teachers, 
Uh, and I'm working in an attainment challenge school, which has been given a lot of extra money by the government. But as teachers, we are charged with closing the attainment gap, so getting kids in poverty, better results, you know, better life chances, which I guess we're all in education for. However, I wonder what your view is on, you know, how easy that is for someone in an educational perspective to do without all the joined up thinking all around it. Yeah, um, thank you. I've been visiting a lot of schools. I still do a lot of kind of public events and all that. I go into schools and meet people. Um, so as much as I'm quite distant from my own education experience, I'm always updating my understanding. And, and what, what I feel about the whole conversation around attainment is that the focus is wrong. Because one of the reasons a certain type of child won't manage in a mainstream classroom is because they lack an, a certain quality of emotional at attainment. Um, the, there's a certain lack of emotional literacy. Uh, you know, certain certain things aren't being modelled to them at home, perhaps because of the stress a family is dealing with. And they're coming into a school and into a society, to be fair, that's relying on very specific social cues and incentives to influence their behaviour. But when you experience adversity to the extent of a lot of the kids that you you have seen up close, then you'll already know that that actually means that it sets you up to misinterpret incentives and social cues because your whole system of assessing what's going on around you is programmed for a hostile environment, which means you will very successfully navigate adversity and hostility. And to some extent, a child like that is very socially sophisticated, but not in the way that's recognised by the curriculum. And the minute that they come into an, a, a, an atmosphere that's not hostile, they don't know how to function. They're just, they're anticipating the conflict, the retribution, they're anticipating the shame. I was hearing a story yesterday at Cheltenham Book Festival where a woman was talking about how on one side she had parents who resented the fact that their kids were learning to read. And on the other side, a school that had taken an adversarial stance on spoken word poetry. And these were the things that she was trying to do to keep these kids in the game somehow, just to keep some kind of connection. Not even about the poetry, it's about the rapport. So what are they uniting around to create the rapport? The activity is almost irrelevant. And she's getting it for every angle. So I emotional attainment Children will become likelier to learn and to believe they can learn and believe that when things get tough, they can keep going once they have a certain emotional belief that how they feel in that moment, while it seems very intense and their head's racing, that that moment will pass and they'll get better at managing that stuff. It's just, there's just, there's so many things a school needs to do now. I can sympathize with teachers, but our society is changing and that's the first place a kid goes, really, to get a sense of the society that they live in, other than their own home. So if we need to radically rethink what a school can offer, then, uh, th then that's what we'll have to do. Can I just say about that as well? Politicians will often turn to education because if you're concerned about social mobility, education for so many years in the past, when we had social mobility, education was the route to social mobility. That was the way to improve yourself and get on, do anything. And and we've lost social mobility, I think you pointed out yourself, we've, we've, it's fossilised, it's very, very difficult now for people to change the circumstances into which they're born. But we still look to education. Do you think we're looking to the wrong place now? No. Um, I, the, the, reason, <laughs> the reason, one of the reasons actually that people will not become as socially mobile as they otherwise might like or society might like is because the current curriculum, by the time someone actually gets through it and gets their qualification, is kind of out of sync with the economy that they're entering. I mean, I remember that the, 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 I got a computing qualification. Do you know what I mean? Wasn't the only sort of computer that we use these days. <laughs> Teachers told me I better stop using a calculator because 
It's not as if I would ever be walking around with one in my pocket everywhere I went. <laughs> <laughs> Early retirement for that teacher, I think. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and so, so, like, we, we've not just got a curriculum where people are being trained to enter an economy where actually what they're really saying is you're going to need to train maybe three, four times. Your career's going to mm -hmm. change all the time because of automation and big data. Um, but also that within that, that there's, no, there's, no, there's no, like, eh, 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 how are you going to live? How are you going to be in this society? Mm -hmm. There's no recognition that's really difficult. <laughs> like, yeah. let's educate you on how the hell you're going to bloody manage because this is a shit storm out here, mate. <laughs> It's the second time I've swore in Parliament today. I'm feeling yeah, quite good about myself. I, I'm not sitting in that chair. You're okay. Aye, no, aye, no, aye. No, aye. So, so I just I, I feel that I feel that the curriculum. I mean, look at sorry, but look at some of the big problems we're experiencing right now. People are always talking about the tribalism, aren't they? They're always talking about the quality of debate. Doesn't matter where you're on the spectrum. You always wish somebody else would just be a bit more civil in a debate. Hmm. People don't even get the chance to debate unless they get to like second year in university. Mm -hmm. The whole idea of discourse is, is, is like, is, is, is esoteric in education. So people are just navigating everything intuitively based on all the prejudices they've inherited, their personal bias, whose face they think is annoying on the telly. <laughs> you know, like you'd be surprised the sort of political wormholes you go down because you find somebody's face annoying. <laughs> you know, it's so true though. And like in school, in school, there's no mention of this is the environment you're actually going to enter, rather than this kind of one that we think might exist. Here are the skills you're actually going to need to have. Here's what diversity of opinion means. So you don't freak out and think the world's ending because somebody said something that you don't agree with and you feel a bit faint. Like, <laughs> let's teach that in school as well as the other stuff because these are skills people need to learn and I think they need to learn them pretty young. So more pressure on you. <laughs> exactly. Go! <laughs> so, and the lady right there in the front row. Yes. yes. Yesterday, I attended a theater performance at the Young Offenders Institution in Polmont. And afterwards, I had an opportunity to talk to one of the more senior correctional officers about what kind of art programs worked. Um, and the first thing he said was, Loki. He said um, that you gave them the vehicle to really address their issues. And so, what I'm interested to hear more from you is, um, what is it you think that you did that worked? What did you walk away from that experience? Um, I'm glad you knowing. asked me that. It's been a while since I've done a job like that, but that was my kind of trade for many years. Um, and, and going into a prison environment with young offenders is not an easy thing for anyone to do, least of all for them, and they've got no choice. So, <laughs> the <laughs> so I. Levity is the first thing. Um, being all right to have a laugh, not take it too serious. But I'll, I'll, I'll share with you this experience, right? I wrote in the last book about working with women in the prison. Um, and, and the reason I wrote about that specifically was because uh, I felt that their experiences mirrored my mother's a wee bit in the sense that they'd experienced abuse earlier in their life and then this had found expression later on as their own, they were transmitting aggression and the things that they had experienced. But there was another thing I didn't write in the book. And one time I was doing this project, it was a six week thing, using rap as a way to engage young men who have all perpetrated violent crimes. And for me, rap, grime, hip hop was my first literary experience. And for a lot of these kids, that's the same. In the culture, people at Creative Scotland might not recognise the validity of that yet, although some of us are working really hard on it. <laughs> but it is the case that that'll be the first piece of art that they'll identify with, that they'll be breaking down in very much the kind of way that, that someone would critically analyse poetry. They're recognising themes, they're recognising callbacks and structure, they're recognising tone, they're feeling something. Um, and so when I went in, I was like, that was my whole gambit. 
was recognising it doesn't matter what song you're listening to and what I personally think of it, you've got, you're having a literary experience and I'm going to deal with you at that level, that you're operating with a sophistication that's not been assumed because you're in here. When I actually got there though, as is always the case, they've always got a wee spanner on the works for you and you've got to be on your toes. So they all knew I was coming. So this wee guy was ready to rap battle me. <laughs> right? So here's how I intuitively navigated that situation, right? I got there, it's first thing, such and such wants to battle you. Straight away, I know if I back down for a challenge in that environment, then I lose my status immediately in the eyes of all these men because that's how toxic masculinity works, right? The problem is, if you want to affect men perpetrating toxic masculinity, you need to understand toxic masculinity like it was a language. You need to really know it, and sometimes you need to use it to navigate and negotiate entry into that community so that you can become somebody that can influence their behavior. And that's controversial, because it looks like you're co-signing other people's crap. Anyway, I do my own thing, so I'm like, I park it, I say, Maybe I'll date later, so I'm leaving it open. So they, 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 they've not decided that I'm a shite bag, I'm a game, I'm, I'm mysterious in their eyes, right? So I get their attention, straight away I'm in there, I'm right in there, I'm just I do the jump rap, rap about jump, that, that's a way for me to send loads and loads of signals that I come from their kind of background, it was only just by chance I didn't end up getting in jail myself. And then uh, they keep going on about the rap battle though, I realise I'm going to have to do it. Uh, because the, the, but the risk is this. A day of the battle, I lose. This other boy becomes the alpha in the group, right? Which is not a situation that you want as a tutor in a learning environment, right? <laughs> or, I really, really do the battle. And if I really do the battle, I'm hurting somebody's feelings. And that presents a risk of disengaging the group, of offending the group, or of violence. So I've got to, now I'm explaining all that like I sat for two hours and thought about it. <laughs> I did all that intuitively. I was like, of course I'll battle you, when do you want to do it? And here, go. And they came up and they done it, and I had to rip him in front of his own pals. <laughs> and, he's in, in that, and I had to do it in a language they understand that would be extremely inappropriate and vulgar in pretty much every other context in this society. But that's why that project worked and that's why that guy, even though I've not been there for three years, brought my name up. Because that's the sort of work that you really need to do. You need to put your stuff on the line, so to speak. And you need to trust your instincts and then even if you make a mistake, you understand why you made a mistake. Um, but I recognise that's not a conventional way to work. <laughs> <laughs> Right, These aren't if, conventional people, though. If, if Nicola Sturgeon and Ruth Davidson start going head-to-head -head in a rap battle <laughs> next week, you know, right. I'll know you've influenced them. I've got, there's a lot of uh, very good... If you, you, by the way, you've, you've had more reaction on social media than all the other guests put together, so I'm not, not surprised, really. But, uh, See, that frightens me a wee bit. Uh, <laughs> that's Positivity is the word I'm getting here. Okay, so, cool. Uh, but before I, I'm going to ask you quite a lot of specific, specific policy questions, which I'm surprised at. But before I do that, just the same, on the same lines as you were taking there, you, you have said quite often when you're challenged, and you talk about this in your, when you're young, when you're growing up, that the, the response to anger is anger, and the response to violence is violence. And you were, you're, you've tried to break that cycle. And politically, you recognise it as well, when people mm. challenge you politically. There's, in fact, one of the best stories is how you came up with the title of the book, Poverty Safari, and your, your relationship with Ellie Harrison and your response. Uh, I don't know if you want to just either tell that story or, or just tell us why that's your instinctive reaction. Mm. So somebody has a go at you and you go right back. Yeah. And why we have to overcome that. We, all of us have to overcome that. Yeah. I was conditioned for conflict with the environment that I grew up in. Um, my way of... Oh, my way of advancing in a conflict was no necessarily the physical stuff. I didn't, I didn't find myself having a natural gift for the fighting, although I would fight. I would, I, I would be fancy my chances sometimes. It was usually boys that were much bigger than me, because the only thing that the tough guys are scared of is a smart person. So you're always coming into conflict, because you're always having to stone your grin in some way. 
Um, so being kind of quick off the draw, being able to get in there with a response that regardless of how tough you are, you're going home the day thinking about what I said to you in front of everybody. It doesn't matter if you batter me. Like, it's going to be slow, painful for you, right? So I used to pride myself in that. That was me sharpening my talons. And, I, and, and, and a kind of quick wittedness came natural in that way. And sometimes I would even foresee conflicts. That's why when I get into debates, I'm very quick with the responses. Because sometimes I foresee the debate, so I prepare the response and just leave it somewhere. It's a bit worrying, actually. But I just always want to be ready, you know? And when it comes to Ellie Harrison, then that was an example of that instinct completely misfiring. Um, completely misfiring and me having to have a hard look at uh, what are my motivations, what are my intentions? What is informing my desire to lash out at someone? Now, I wasn't necessarily that mean to her or mean about her, but I made some comments that in the context of my own head, I knew what I meant, but when they get on social media, then they can be interpreted as anything from cruel to like deeply misogynistic, right? And, uh, and, and, and then- Can just for those who don't know, Ellie Harrison was an artist who was gonna spend a year in Glasgow, I, living in Glasgow, and, and you said- She got 15 grand off Creative Scotland mm. to do a kind of action research project. So her plan was to stay, stay in one area of Glasgow and investigate, could a freelance artist dedicate all their time to one community? without having to travel the country to make a living. But she didn't communicate that very effectively in the beginning. So that's where she was at fault. And, and you called it a poverty survival. Ah, exactly. Yeah. And, uh, and then I kind of, I didn't realise there was this massive backlash also brewing and that kind of became a sort of, of lightning rod for yeah. some of it. And a lot of people were very vile and using what was legitimate anger as a way just to be really cruel and nasty about someone. So anyway, once I came to and I realised actually maybe some of the things I've said have not been helpful, then I sat and thought about it and I realised because of my commitment to class politics and my belief in this idea of punching up, this thing that people on the left sometimes will say to justify doing anything to anyone because they see everything in power dynamics. So Ella Harrison's nothing, she's just middle class. And when I punch her up, in my head, I'm punching the whole class system. But it's a bit different when you have to get in the room with that person and you can see them, their friends hugging them as if someone's died and you can see them sobbing and you realize that she's been through something that I would go through a couple of times after that myself and really be able to empathize. And, uh, and I just thought, I still get emotional talking about it because it's an example of how sometimes your mind will present with a very compelling feeling that you are completely right and completely justified. And in that moment, you couldn't be more wrong. You couldn't. And I've just had examples of this so many times that, 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 that now I try to watch myself from launching into things like that. Because actually what motivated me to do that wasn't class politics, I was jealous. I was jealous that Creative Scotland was giving her money when I've not even got the balls to fill out an application form for Creative Scotland. Because I feel like Creative Scotland's not for people like me. And so I was just like, get it right up the lot of yous. And just saw it as an example, I was like, and, and using that as a veil, really, to conceal my own resentment, my own inadequacies. And, uh, and, 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 and that was, was the, I thought that that was important to write about because what I was really trying to do was make a point about this call-out culture that we see, where sometimes it's very legitimate. It's very legitimate, right? See if you're going after a tax avoiding CEO of a multinational company and he's using everything in his power to try and evade justice and hitting out with press releases and all sorts to try and create a false perception in the public mind, call them out. But see when it's somebody actually in your own community mm. and you've not even sat down to talk to them, <laughs> to ask them what they're doing, <laughs> and you just go on social media and decide you're going to try and ruin their life or their career. <laughs> like, maybe that's not the most efficient use of your energy. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I see that for both sides now. Yeah. My door's open for anybody that wants to ask me any questions. Yeah. Yeah, not, not many people change their mind publicly, though, which is, I mean, again, that's... Well, again, it was, 
it, it, when you're talking about call out culture, you've got to get the, the, the recognise as a legitimacy that it's a, it's a political, historically successful political strategy to affect change. But social media has completely changed the goalposts. It means that you can just go after somebody you personally don't like and say whatever you want behind an anonymous account, and that person has to account for that, regardless. And uh, I still experience some of that stuff myself, you know. So um, I, I try to conduct myself a bit better now. Well, we'll take some more questions in a second. I've got a couple here, uh, remind myself. First is uh, very specific. One's about uh, should the care, what changes would you make to the care system? What changes would you make to youth work in particular? And the other one's finally about universal credit in Glasgow. So there's three policy questions that okay. are very specific as well. But care work, um, well, all the care workers that I know are now working as part-time cleaners and taxi drivers and um, pretty much any other job they can get other than in care because they're demoralised, completely demoralised. I mean, every, I think everyone's feeling a wee bit tired and fed up wherever they're working, you know. But I think in that area, not only that, but the additional insult of being regarded as an unskilled worker in some kind of way, um, it's just, it makes no sense to me. I mean, people who would choose to go into that line of work are salt of the earth for me. Um, and there's unpaid carers as well, obviously. A lot of women and families are doing that. Women in my family are doing that. Uh, I, I know that it's not necessarily privatised. I know that there's a sort of one of these public-private partnerships. Yeah. But I think I pretty much every area where these sort of partnerships or that sort of model has tried produces unforeseen consequences. I'm not saying that it being just publicly rolled out and owned and publicly kind of sorted out, it's going to make it perfect. There's still going to be examples of people not getting the treatment they should, of people being sometimes mistreated, wherever there are human beings, that these things are going to happen. But I just don't like the idea of there being a profit motive attached to this kind of work. Because what's the incentive? What is the incentive? And if we don't get the incentive right, then of course the thing's not going to work. I'm not against business and people make money. I just don't think you can incentivize companies to take care of people properly because it's thankless and unforgiving work and there's not a lot of money in it. That's my view on that. And uh, a more topical one, universal credit, it's obviously already in place for, for single claimants. It's been rolled out in Glasgow, I think, pretty soon this week or maybe next week. Do you... Woo-hoo! Uh, <laughs> well, the, the benefit system generally, I mean, what, do, you have, do you have the answer? I mean, not the, there is no, an answer, but... No, no, definitely don't have the answer. No one has the answer. Mm-hmm. Um, not even one political party has the answer. It's a complicated problem. And so it requires a diversity of perspectives to really get to the root of it. I think that universal credit could have been a great idea. Streamline the system, remove the stigma attached to different kinds of benefits, make it more simple, bring, use the internet technology so people can access it. Actually, what's happened is that the government has just created another big cumbersome, incompetent bureaucracy. Um, the only area where it's not incompetent is in the level of hostility and contempt that it can treat people with, with these uh, compliance meetings. The welfare conditionality currently in the UK is, 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 is becoming a human rights issue. In fact, I remember saying this when I was being auditioned for a previous episode of Question Time, and I think they passed on me. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just like, oh, this universal credit stuff might seem cool to know, but see when they're all getting hauled out in front of human rights courts and all that, and, some, and it's on somebody then we'll see then uh, what the deal is. Universal credit uh, is, is, is widely acknowledged as a failure. The government are saving face, they're relying on a certain level of confusion within elements of the public, whether it's poor people angry at other poor people, or whether it's people who have never had to access benefits who just resent the idea of someone getting something with no concept of why they're getting it, or the humiliation a person has to go through to get the benefit in the first place. And, and if you, actually map the universal credit rollout 
onto communities, it correlates in a very linear way with the explosion in food bank use. So universal credit is driving homelessness, residential instability, mental health problems, suicide, and, uh, and, and, and it's, it's a government institution that's supposed to help these people. I mean, of course, if somebody's taking the mic, be frank with them. But if you're gonna sanction somebody, sanction them to go to a doctor, because that's usually why people are messing about at the job centre, because they've got issues, addictions, messed up families. So if you're gonna make them do something, integrate health with welfare, and send them down the hall to a counsellor or a doctor and say, if you don't get to the bottom of this problem, then we'll stop your money, but we're giving you a chance to go and we'll sort it out. I know that's not a solution, but you know. I would like to see Scotland doing that. If we can get a cop in every school in this country, then why can't we have a child psychologist? Why can't we have a GP? Just integrate health with everything, because we're just dealing with too many epidemics. You know, just, there should just be a doctor down the hall, <laughs> wherever you work. Very good. Can I ask you, there's another one that's come up here on social media, an odd one that I just said, but uh, and I'm conscious of what you said in your book about this. Um, uh, you were at a public meeting and you talked about, I think you brought up President Trump. Well, I've just been asked to bring up Brexit. But Brexit and Trump... It sounds like almost kind of like balking violently. Yeah, 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 no. Bringing Brexit, up Brexit, it's like a kind of nastiest indigestion <laughs> ever. <laughs> but, the, but the interesting thing is that these things are at the heart of political discussion at the moment. They're utterly dominating this parliament and Westminster. But does it have anything to do with solving poverty? Does it have anything to do with, you know, your life or the life of those around you? I came to the view after a lot of thinking and conflict about it, that the central problem in our society just now is the wealth polarisation between the super wealthy and the political influence that this buys them and how they dominate politics everywhere. They just do, right? Um, now, we're in a stage where companies like Amazon, like Lockheed Martin, Apple, whatever, you, Exxon, Mobil, they are more financially powerful than governments, than single nation states. Now, I'm not, I'm not making an anti-capitalist argument here. I'm not gone that far. I'm simply saying the only way that you can rein that in is collectivizing at a national level, which is why the EU just fined Google $4 billion, right? Do you think Theresa May is going to find Google four billion dollars? <laughs> really? And even currently, do you think if Scotland was independent, would we have the courage to do that? And I'm no mocking whoever would be in government. I recognise that is difficult because these companies are powerful. But for me, for all its flaws, what the EU represents, apart from sometimes being a total breeding ground for lobbyists, also, there's a conflict there because you've got other forces at work that are saying, no, Google, you're getting it. It doesn't matter. Send your lawyers. Like, we're the EU. Do you know who we are? <laughs> Do you know? And just pushing back and representing people's interests. And I just don't see how Britain, on its own, is going to do that. And for me, that's the fundamental problem. So if Farage is not talking about addressing that, what's he talking about? Because that's what all of the problems that Brexiteers of varying degrees of, of, of grievance have. That's the problems they're experiencing in their employment and their communities or where spikes in the population create attitudes towards immigration. It's all because of austerity that's an absolutely mandated thing to do in a world where big companies call the shots. That's it. Mm. Yeah. Mm. I think there's one part of your book as well, you actually, you, you're quite interesting, you defend people who voted for Brexit because... Because <laughs> yeah. I like to make life hard for myself. I agree, yes. No, but you did, you, you said, you know, because people voted for Brexit and then the, the well-intentioned, educated, liberal middle class turned and went, oh my goodness, you know, yeah. 
who are these people and, and began savaging them and attacking them? And yeah, no, uh, obviously people were right to, people are absolutely right to condemn uh, racism, any forms of xenophobia. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm on board with that. That's, that's, not even, that's not even, it's not even something that's up for debate with me. But we run into problems when we start thinking in generalities because I'm not racist, but I was thinking about voting leave. And it was just because I had that thought I just shared with you where I was like, actually. So you have to assume that a lot of people out there were like that and were conflicted about it in some level. Now I recognise that a lot of the way that the Brexit campaign launched its message, if you can call it that, where cues of people of colour on the side of buses and the language, dehumanising language to describe them. Often they're fleeing war zones that, that are conflict zones precisely because of mistakes that we've made when we've intervened there. I'm not blaming it all on us. I know it's complicated. Um, but these are the things that, 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 these are the things that I would pin on people like Boris Johnson, Nigel Farage, Jacob Rees-Mogg, who understand the complexity, but undermine it and underplay it because they know if they can just marshal enough anger and create enough confusion, then they will be granted the sort of political battering ram that gets them where they want to be, which is that in any event, they'll be able to exploit this for their own careers, businesses, whatever. It's the act of real. <laughs> just, and what, and, 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 and I'll always, I'll always not necessarily defend I work, I've done a lot of work in additional needs schools, right, where a high percentage of the people there is actually behavioural needs that they've got and behavioural problems. And that's the sort of places where you see these racist, xenophobic, absolutely bonkers attitudes at a very, very young age, which tells me it's being inherited from someone else. Now, that's a difficult thing to reconcile when we want to just see things in binaries. But I'm dealing with children that have got really disturbing racist attitudes. Am I supposed to just condemn them because it looks good on Twitter? Am I for the left that says, somebody in jail for mugging people, stealing motors, taking drugs, or even drug dealing, deserves to be at least understood for the social context in which their attitudes and criminality emerged, and that I shouldn't be very, I shouldn't just be wanting to jail them and be unforgiving and hug a hoodie and all that. But then when it comes to this issue, I'm just gonna cast these kids aside and no try and understand what the hell is going on with you. I can't do that. I can't do it. I won't do it. Mm. And anybody who thinks that you should have to, there's no very much use in a real community where these issues are live. It's easy to get on Twitter and say what you think's right and wrong. You know, when you're faced and confronted with the reality of people who lead very complex lives, who are navigating issues intuitively, who always just feel like they're getting shafted, then emotionally they come to a place, and we all do it. It just depends how socially acceptable your particular resentment is. This morning I was in the queue, and the old lady at the front of the queue is reading through her purse, and she's taking ages. And in my head I'm thinking all these horrible things about old people. <laughs> <laughs> do you know what I mean? It's just a kind of leap that I made, I don't then, Luckily, there isn't a politician out there who's saying it's all the old people's fault. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> I know there are some. <laughs> you know, and, and that's not me trying to explain away or justify any sort of xenophobic or racist attitude. It's just that these social conditions and the stress that some people are under and that feeling that they're not getting heard, they'll get exploited by genuine racists who kind of put the ear out and they're like, I'll listen to you. I'll listen to your concerns. And, and I think that just, and, and a lot of the grassroots left-wing activists already know this, right? They know this. They're in the communities dealing with the actual problems that give rise to xenophobia. They're no grandstanding on it. They're dealing with housing rights. They're dealing with tenancy rights. Mm. They're dealing with zero hours contracts. Because that is the quantum mechanics of the populism. Deal with the issues, you've got a safety valve. Everybody can calm down a wee bit. And that's what they're in there doing. I don't criticise the anti-racists, um, I don't even want to sound like that. Of course you would condemn racism. That's the default position. It's just, it's just that a lot of people get caught in the crossfire. Mm. 
A lot of people haven't been educated. They don't know how to talk. They're reading certain newspapers where certain things fly. That's how they talk. Does that mean that they just get discarded and forgotten about for all remembered time? Uh, or are they worth getting out and talking to? And I'll always maintain the hope that people can change and people will come round. And it's not a natural position to hate other human beings, I don't think. Anybody ever seen a racist doing yoga? <laughs> <laughs> Anybody ever seen a racist at a meditation class? It's absolutely related to anger and resentment that just finds a political expression for a lot of people. You know what I mean? Okay. Like, it's... Uh, uh, who can I blame? Whose fault is it? Right, let me apprehend as much reasoning as I can to justify this stupid assumption that I've made. Hmm. For some people, obviously, it's a bit more pathological than that, though I do accept that. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, last question, Dan, just because there's so many other things I wanted to ask you. I, I promised I'd ask you about social media, but we haven't had time. But, uh, um, and it's a personal one, again, um, it's something you brought up in your own book, which is uh, that you might, uh, musically might suffer from second album syndrome, you know, so you, you've, you've come with a set of values and issues that you feel and you've lived personally, um, but you're now in a different chapter in your life, and you're getting more prosperous, and you've got a young family, and you're breaking the cycle yourself, so will that actually stop you being able to talk about the very issues that you've been talking about, you know? as you get more removed from the very community that you came from, that this all came from? Yeah. Um, obviously, I've consi I consider that every day, mm. which is why I, I tend to accept invitations to go all across the country uh, to communities, um, which is not necessarily that lucrative. You know, it's because I want to do it. Whether it's Levendale Hospital the other day, Kirkcaldy Food Bank, few months back, I was back down there again last week talking to teachers um, all the time. You know, that's a large part of my diary, you know, and, and very often they need to force me to take travel expenses and all that. You know, I, I just go because one, I need to keep my head to the ground and understand what the issues are and how people are talking about the issues as well. Because when I write something, I want it to reflect the community that I'm writing about, not just a very dry, here are the issues. I want them to feel, not necessarily that I'm agreeing with everything they think, but that it's a real authentic reflection of what they're saying, because I know that's part of the frustration and the isolation culturally, is even when you're being discussed, when your community's being discussed, you somehow just feel absent from the conversation. Um, but I do recognise that my, uh, whatever success that I'm enjoying now, does I am going to change. I'm not going to resist the change because I've been changing all my life. Um, what I will do is document it all and write and reflect on it. Because we always hear these, I don't know how things are going to end up for me, right? But if they keep going the way they're gone, I'm not going to be living in Calderwood. Mm. Right, I'm going to need to move after I get new Wendy's. <laughs> right? <laughs> Right? <laughs> uh, uh. So, but we always hear the story of the person who came for the hard upbringing and then they made it, and that was it. We don't see all of the tiny microscopic concessions that they made incrementally to their basic integrity in order to become unrecognisable to the community where they originated. There's just no way that people who grew up in a scheme and then made millions of pounds can legitimately say, I still know what it's like in the scheme. But you don't see anybody writing about what it's like to change. I mean, what are all the temptations? What's it, what's it like? For me, I, I've travelled first class a few times now. And I'm booking the ticket and looking on my shoulder as if somebody's got to see me. And it's like natural for me to want to travel in comfort. It's natural for anybody to want to travel in comfort and, 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 and to be able to open a pack of a monster munch and not elbow someone in the face. <laughs> But I worry about the day where I get to the point that I'm no conflicted about it. The day that I forget that the majority of the train are all just sitting like the set of children of men. Do you know what I mean? And there's <laughs> Dugs and Wayne's greeting and suitcases everywhere and just open tins and just anarchy. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I don't want the day to come when I get on the train and, 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 and I forget what that's like. Um, but I, I know that that might happen. 
and I'll just I'll write honestly as I continue to go. I'm sure you will. Dan, can I just say thank you very much? What a fantastic discussion. Uh, it's been a real pleasure. And uh, can I thank you, first of all, actually, our audience. Uh, thank you for giving up your time this evening, coming and joining us and for the, the participation. Uh, it's a real pleasure. There's more events tomorrow. Uh, particularly want to say Dan is going to be signing copy of his, copies of his book, Poverty Safari, down in the uh, lobby in a few moments. But can I ask you to join me in thanking Dan McGarvey? <laughs>